Hello, my friend. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And if you are in um, any part of the world, look up right now because there might be a balloon spying on you. Dude, it is uh, quite crazy what China is up to, man. I find it quite fascinating that they kind of are just... Uh, creepily sending stuff out and then i mean it started with covid uh it started out um i mean first started out with like um whatever like you know um, what's the word replica products like you know uh imitation products and then like a smuggle good that's my daughter screaming so please ignore that and then it moved to other stuff like um i mean the replica stuff still, still continues but then they have different kinds of categories and then everything started being outsourced then they sent covid and now they're sending out balloons and anyway I'm, i don't know much about it i'm not a spy master i'd love to be one anyhow i was reading about this thing called sky trash and that's what got me right interested about talking uh about this on the on today's episode because there is this thing apparently where there's a lot of stuff we've sent up into the sky and also now into space and that stuff accumulates just like how we are dumping in our backyard and we're dumping into our oceans we're dumping and dumping we're sending off stuff up there as well and some of the sky trash of course space trash can be satellites that are dead which are just orbiting um and that's another serious concern now because when we do get ready to have frequent human travel in space we're going to have so much shit that's going to be congested we're going to have like massive traffic massive um threats of collision with junk which we put out there great uh, but uh closer to us it, at at a level which is accessible already is this thing called sky trash which is um a lot of these weather balloons which are put up by countries which 20% fall and are recovered apparently this is what the article said but a lot of the other shit just stays up there and that's apparently what the US fighter craft uh, fighter jets brought down over the US in the past i mean a uh, f- few days but imagine you put up trash and, and, and what i found hilarious is a lot of it it can be just party balloons which are going and collecting up there and imagine you've got like a F22 or whatever F18 or whatever those crazy lethal killing machines and the pilots trained for combat with actual threats and going and shooting down party balloons i mean this would be quite uh, embarrassing right but imagine those have you seen those chinese lanterns the things you light up on the beach with a candle inside and it just floats away and everyone starts waving at it like fucking retards and the next thing you know it's become sky trash and it's being shot down by an f18 assault uh, fighter jet and i think it's a sweet irony i don't know I I think we are I don't know what the word is man it's just that we we're, we're in a place which we're pretty messed up uh with all this the mistrust uh with con- countries almost going to war based on balloons uh countries kind of overreacting at the drop of a hat with just it's let me give it It's like you you're in school and you've got a bunch of assholes as classmates but they were they were fine because you know what they were assholes but they were fine just being assholes but now there's this hot girl in class who's joy and a hot boy if I want to be inclusive and now every asshole wants that hot thing whether it's a girl or a boy or a whatever gender and so their true assholeness is coming out and at the at the smallest provocation they want to fucking okay so so they are, what is the hotness we need to identify what this hot thing that everyone wants it is it is it oil is it information is it world domination is it nuclear power so i feel if someone like me some great person identifies this one hot thing the equivalent of a hot girl that every country wants whether it's ping or modi or or putin or Biden or Trudeau or Macron I'm this is not like a general knowledge kind of just dropping off uh, names of all the world leaders but you get the gist I you know, if we identify that and take it away and send it up in a balloon which no one can find because a 6 year old girl in Bangladesh blew a candle and said I want this balloon up in the air or someone made a wish on the beach of Singapore saying I'm putting up a Chinese lantern and it just flies away with all our hopes and dreams I think that would be a sweet kind of poetic justice to all these pricks who are kind of constantly throwing us into horrible horrific 
clashes which they think is important but the rest of us have no say in because we supposedly put them there and yeah it's just awful because actually if the planet doesn't want us here and if nature wants to fuck with us we just saw what happened in syria and turkey it can really fuck us up and we have absolutely no power over it so this whole talk about we should worry about global warming because we just worried because we we worried what's going to happen to us but if the planet really wants us off yeah trust me my friend i think it can kick us off with all the preparations we have we can be booted before we know it crazy anyway man I, it's, it's it's really hard to see or hear what's happening in these countries right now in turkey and syria and it's just awful how a lot of it is caused by human greed by negligence and this 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 disregard for other people so terrible i'm not going to preach or patronize but just my feeling about it is it's pretty pretty sad but huh what can i do besides talk about it and that's maybe in its own way arrogant and impotent but words are all, all i have Anyway, let's before I start talking shit, let's move on uh, to today's guest. Um Dr. John Van Wy is a British historian of science with a focus on Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell. I got that wrong. Alfred What's wrong with me? Alfred Russell Wallace. Say that fast. Try saying it fast. Um in today's conversation we talk about evolution and how it was perceived back in the day before Darwin to how Darwin made it a scientific thing that people can study and how its roots are so important to understand our past our present and our future to where we are today where there's again doubt and doubt being seeded in our education system and curriculums where people are doubting the theory of evolution and we talk about a whole lot more in this space and Dr John Van Wy is an expert he's an historian and it's really really fascinating hearing his take on what we are where we are who we are and where we are going and what we are doing and who we are becoming so stay tuned for a fantastic conversation with british historian dr john van why only here on the soapy rao show as always i appreciate you tuning in to this podcast until next week goodbye god bless take care of yourselves cheers Dr. John Van Wy, welcome to the Soapy Rao show. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. Lovely. So, um well, where do we stand today? Uh, let's let's maybe start with that because um interestingly as you pointed out, there has been the idea of evolution which has been accepted and presented actually many years back, but accepting happened. And we sit here today uh with the world in turmoil in some sense, but also torn apart in ideologies and maybe can you take me through where we stand on you know evolution and its its origin yeah uh, well you I, you're quite right um evolution was before darwin a, a very controversial and ridiculed idea deeply un, unpopular and uh, After Darwin's book The Origin of Species appeared in 1859 there was a lot of debate a lot of fighting about it it was um, ridiculed but within about 20 years the scientific debate over evolution was over yeah and this is something most people today haven't heard about <laughs> that the scientific debate ended way back in the 1870s and ever since then evolution has been accepted as a fact and even amongst the general public back then it was also widely seen as ah well that's been sorted now that evolution is a fact human evolution is a fact okay but in the 150 years or so since then things have changed especially since the beginning of the 20th century there's been more of this splintering that you mentioned mm. as a splintering of audiences and readerships and so today there's uh it seems like a wider proportion of the public thinks that evolution is in some way controversial 
or up for grabs, not settled, or mm. indeed just uh, simply not true, something like that. Uh, so it's a very strange thing to happen that you went from a, a scientific question having been settled and over time the evidence for it has mounted to to the moon. I mean, we know that evolution happens just as well as we know the Earth is round. And yet there's wide um, parts of society around the world that people think that it's um, not true, that it's a, a terrible conspiracy or something like that. What a strange paradox we're in. And, you know, that's what I find you mentioned. Uh, I, I find that quite interesting when you say evolution is as um, proven as the Earth is round. But is it anymore? Because we have these people now who call themselves flat earth uh flat earthers and <laughs> and that's the strange thing right it's um on an evidence front it seems to be um there's proof beyond doubt that evolution is a process and not just specific to human beings but it's uh all life takes um the course of evolution but it seems like while while we've proven evolution we've kind of also devolved in some other aspect of social life or in some um, aspect of thinking where we start putting doubt in these concepts so uh, from your perspective as someone who studied these groups uh, from when say Charles Darwin faced uh, ridicule and faced um, doubt from the public at large when he was presenting his papers and then his book about evolution to now why with 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 undeniable evidence out there what has shifted because clearly the evidence is, is, is just gotten stronger so what has changed that has uh, led to this doubting whether it's in evolution whether in the fact that the earth is round uh, introducing these books in schools about intelligent design there are so many things which seem to be done a, not for the benefit of uh, human progress or human evolution in that way, if you want to call it. Yeah, I think the process that we have witnessed is not, let's not think of it in terms of there's more evidence and there's more science, mm -hmm. which there is, but there's also been a, a vast diversification mm -hmm. of the number of kinds of evidence and right. the specialization that's necessary to understand these things is so great that only experts are aware of it. Mm. And the diversification of information isn't just happening in science, it's happening everywhere else. So yeah. there are ever more diverse kinds of information out there, which includes everything, including, for example, all of the information you could read about flat earth uh, mm -hmm. ideas, right? There's, there's who knows how many websites and books and pamphlets and videos on this subject, right? The number is increasing, the diversity is increase, increasing. So that means that there are readerships of people who can fill their heads with that information, just yeah. as you have in science, specialists filling their heads with their specialized information about how every little tiny nuance of evolution works. So as information in all kinds of areas expands and expands, so do the readerships. And so it becomes more difficult for us to understand or even know about what's going on in all the other areas. So that makes it in a way understandable why people who hear about something from a completely different area, in this case, mm -hmm. evolutionary sciences, as something they don't know anything about except for what they've heard in their own area of information, which is, oh, that's, a, that's a, a terrible a lie or conspiracy. And it's possible to believe that if the world of information you live in doesn't contain anything else. And that's a strange thing coming to this uh, context of where we are right now as a historian, because many times people say history is the story as told by the by the by the conquerors by the winners right um so now if you look at these these groups whether you know i was talking to someone yesterday um as a pre 
sort of uh, interview for the podcast and um he lives in the US and he was totally sold with this idea and or rather the version of truth as he sees it um you know with 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 the whole american situation that he he according to his truth there's no joe biden that that's a double uh, playing uh, the role of the president the white house is actually empty the country's being run by the military so he and he was convinced i mean and i was you know i i try to listen with an open mind uh because i don't want to jump to any conclusions or put my i mean because i'm getting him on the show i want to get his w- version of the truth so, but i asked him how do you tell people because he says the vaccine is harmful it, it's it's an entire conspiracy to to harm humanity and but he believed it so now who am i to say you're bonkers or <laughs> it's a conspiracy right uh, so similarly if if a person believes and that's their version of truth and everything they read it reinforces that idea is anything wrong with it or say for instance you go to a extremely staunch group of believers who say god created man in his in his version of himself and created eve or adam and eve or whatever the religious belief behind it is and if you say you guys are fools evolution is proven um it's it's clearly going to cause conflict but what i'm trying to understand is can we as now humans who are in some form dependent on artificial intelligence and we're plugged into the web we have these smart devices and there's a fear of these chatbots taking over or ai kind of replicating human behavior so there is a lot more potential for the splintering uh, uh, uh you know aspects going to you know this splintering happening in the future but is it okay to have multiple versions of reality for multiple kinds of people because maybe just that group might not be able to process the idea of evolution some people might just be happy with the the denying those photos from the space station that show that the earth is round so what what is something that can make people unified just by being different or creating diverse uh, realities or differing realities can that create a cohesive cohesive society going forward i really don't think so uh, mm-hmm. i think that the process of of diversification and the increase of information of all kinds is a process that's still continuing mm. and it's hard to see it going uh, in any other way so you talked about people having different truths yeah they do and and they always have yeah uh, for example the idea that uh, vaccines uh, and vaccination are, are are evil or yeah. harmful or part yeah. of a conspiracy that also goes back to um, victorian times mm. and uh, the other scientific figure you mentioned alfred russell wallace mm-hmm. was a believer in that and he wrote uh, quite a lot about it he thought that uh, vaccination was uh, terribly harmful and that the establishment wouldn't listen yeah and so on uh, and also even back then it was already possible to live in different worlds of information and, and reading that filled mm. your head from what you already believe and that is a dangerous thing so i don't think the diversification is going to slow down or stop yeah but becoming at least familiar with the fact that that's the world that we live in and yeah. that there are a lot of different uh, ideas out there is this i think the be- the best we can hope for is for people to become more familiar with the fact that there are a lot of contradictions out there and and it's not the case that everyone's op- uh, opinion is equally valid when it comes to talking about the natural world and verifiable realities um one person's opinion is not as good as another So Absolutely. for example, you yeah. wouldn't want to consult my opinion on football because yeah. I'm not an expert on football. Yeah, I'm and just by talking something. to you on today's episode doesn't make me an expert on Darwin, right? Because I'm here to learn and understand. But you as you clearly said, it's it's you need weight in uh especially these very you know verifiable kind of ideas, right? Yeah. So when it comes to flat earth or vaccination or evolution yeah subjectively speaking uh, we know that these things are true 
uh, what to do about the fact that there are lots of people very upset about them uh, who think that they're false. It's a big, it's a big question. It's a big problem. Uh, yeah. I think there is a, uh, an ever increasing gap between the experts and the general reader, the general public, that it's yeah. hard to get access to what the experts know because experts have to be experts and talk to other experts. And that's uh, not the same. That doesn't mean that they have any skill or ability to communicate that to a general audience. In fact, often they're the worst people to communicate <laughs> their area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, to the, the a connect audience. is a little weak. Yeah, because the terminology or the words. Yeah. Yeah. And also because if you're such an expert at something, it's you cannot easily put yourself mentally in the situation of someone who doesn't know anything about your field. That's so far away from where you are. Yeah, yeah. That it's yeah. hard to start from the beginning in order to explain things from the ground up to a beginner or an outsider, as it were. That's very difficult to do. So we need people who are in between the experts and the general public to try and communicate uh, what is known in those areas of expertise. You know, another worrying thing is um, a friend of mine uh, uh, about a year and a half back, this was sort of in the peak lockdown of the pandemic. Uh, he was telling me about his, his concern. He's a psychiatrist and he was getting worried because, see, when he consults a patient, he is responsible for the consequences of his medication or his advice and he's a doctor he's taken an oath to protect the human life whether it's through mental health practices or whether even as another doctor might do it to his or her expertise but he was worried that there are these groups now of people suddenly coming up saying uh facebook group for mental health or during the lockdown there's a lot of that right mental who mental a group for depression and relief or anxiety relief and he said the problem is none of these people are psychologists or psychiatrists, but they are people saying, I've been through anxiety, let me help you. Now, the problem arises that people will join the group and might feel a little better by realizing they're not alone in this. But if it escalates to a problem which is not uh, being handled by the group, then it might lead to self-harm or suicide. In which case, where is the accountability? That was his worry, right? And that sort of leads in to this place right now where yes you know the experts do need to communicate it in a more understandable way to the layman but at the same time there are these self-proclaimed experts who aren't really qualified to call themselves experts but as a result of so many people just sort of flocking to these various truths there's a lot of scope i see or i fear for manipulation and as a result you have these subgroups if you want to call it these Cults, like I was talking to someone about this in the UK, you have this group called Incel. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, uh, of how these boys who feel disenfranchised are flocking to this ideology that it's not their fault, but it's the the women who are causing this rejection, and they should sort of boycott all kind of uh, feminine ideology. So, just as, a, as an example, like it it could cause a lot of harm, and not just a passive uh, moving forward of society, but a devolution, if you want to call it, of cohesive civilization, right? Yes, I think our education systems need to include some kind of focus on how to uh, identify expertise. Mm. Because, as you point out, there are infinite possibilities now for people to represent themselves in any way they choose yeah and this even happens in in my area where you have people with no qualifications or training or competence in history of science representing themselves as historians of science yeah and saying things that are absurd and ridiculous <laughs> and they also have a, a sort of cult yeah cult-like followings and it's yeah very very cult-like in 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 the solidarity for the cause the belief that there's a moral cause to set the record straight to do to do right to do justice and so on and that kind of uh, making things into a moral struggle uh, is harmful in its own way in the sense that it's not a search for truth or historical accuracy but rather a struggle to to win 
the argument at any cost, to find anything that will back up arguments of the of the cult. And so, yeah, um, the, yeah, we live in a world in which expertise, or, or, or let me say, appearing to be an expert, has become very easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you have enough followers on social um, communities, then you you can like say for instance. I come up and say, you know, I have theories about Darwin. I believe that his popular thing of survival of the fittest is wrong. It's pro, um, it, 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 it's got a bias against people of color and it's got, um, you know, it, it's anti-ageist, it's anti-weightage, whatever. Right now I can drop all these new woke terms and say I have 5,000, 10,000 people on Twitter and you've got 1,000 people and I can actually win the online battle against someone who's highly qualified as a historian of science and you're saying no it's not any of these things right <laughs> which yeah. is ridiculous yes but that's where we are now it's the right. uh, the the appearance and popularity now mm. i guess counts for more than actual knowledge qualification or... and knowledge yeah. yeah so appearance is everything but that's not really that new. Uh, that's been around, I think, as long as the humans have been around. Right. So you speak about, or rather, there is this concept, uh, which is sort of not synonymous, but always dropped when Charles Darwin's spoken about, which is survival of the fittest. But there's the other thing, which is the thing you mentioned in your talk, which is survival of the luckiest, right? Um, so what can we see going forward like from say the agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution now to the information technology revolution um with the human being per se uh maybe the human mind the human being the, the ability to adapt the ability to sort of um live in the in an environment which is changing so rapidly uh what have you probably witnessed uh from this this evolution point of view when it comes to certain things. I'll just give you the reason I'm asking the question is because you see people talking about how our, uh, the, like the wisdom tooth is no longer used, our jaws are getting narrower or or certain uh, other traits. So so what are the things you've maybe observed from physical traits to mental traits to general overall human traits over the past three, four hundred years? Oh, well, over the last three or four hundred years, I think you will find this uh, very little has changed because the uh, process of biological evolution takes normally such a long time right. that anything very, very big or interesting takes thousands of generations to be right. visible. And we're not used to time scales like that. We're right. used to a human lifetime. So mm -hmm. I think the only thing only thing that has visibly changed in the last few hundred years, people have become taller mm. and bigger because of increased nutrition. Mm. But that's not a biological change. Uh, you could have gone back in time with the time machine and fed people in the Middle Ages with modern food and they would get just as, as tall. Um, but mm. one thing that has happened in the last, I think, uh, three or 4,000 years mm -hmm. is that our brains have become smaller, which mm. is not what you would expect. Yeah. Because we yeah. always think of, of human uh, evolution and development as a story of the brain getting bigger. Yeah. Which it is for 99% uh, of human evolution. Yeah, that's the brains that got bigger, yes. But the brain size has become smaller. Uh, what that means or what's caused that, uh, nobody knows. My own pet theory would be that it, it probably does have to do with, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, nutrition. <coughs> Maybe we are so well fed now that we can get by with uh, a smaller but better fed brain than our ancestors. I really don't know. But, but when it comes seems... to predicting the future yeah. about evolution, that there's no such thing, yeah. really. Uh, the only thing you can predict is that there will be change. That's it. <laughs> the only constant is change, yeah. Um, now the reason I also was thinking of that is because I was uh, reading about this uh, these studies right now which are about 
health span and longevity and um and and towards that um uh, effort this person this doctor was talking about how the physical shape of the human now has changed uh, i wouldn't say on an evolutionary front but uh, on a lifestyle front with the environment with the kind of food which is predominantly processed with sugar uh, the 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 predominance of type 1 diabetes in children so all these kind of things are they indications of of things to come or uh, will they affect us on a genetic level which uh, as a result will ev- uh, affect evolution so uh, is that something you can comment on or well it it would affect human evolution if it was an effective filter by which some people lived and some people did it mm-hmm. but because of modern medicine mm-hmm. people who would have died uh, now live so we do all sorts of things that would would shorten our lives if it wasn't for modern medicine so these things yeah. can can continue so given the fact that modern medicine exists and probably exists in the future all of those things that you mention uh, are not going to change us it just means that the percentage of people suffering from uh, that form of diabetes and other things uh, will increase but as long as they're still covered by modern medicine that won't have any effect on human evolution if you go back in time to the agricultural evolution yeah. revolution in say 7 8000 years ago yeah when human beings went from being hunter gatherers where all of our food came from what we could gather in the landscape yeah to growing food and becoming farmers and eating what we now eat big staples those people were much less well nourished than their hunter gatherer neighbors and ancestors yeah but they made so much more food by farming than could be made by hunting and gathering that their populations exploded and they replaced all the hunter gatherers in the world so they were less healthy but it did not stop them from becoming more numerous and prospering maybe we're seeing a parallel today that we yeah. have terrible diets now <laughs> yeah but we have modern medicine to cover us so we're still going to become more and more numerous and it's not going to stop us so the healthy people need to watch out <laughs> the clearly the fittest aren't surviving <laughs> yeah being healthy won't uh, well perhaps it still gives you some advantages but yeah i think uh, living an unhealthy lifestyle doesn't seem to be enough of a hindrance and you've got modern medicine there to help out and has that um and h- how does that journey work like the evolution of medicines i mean is that something which is a reactionary kind of um movement or is it something that uh sorry if this is not the, the a topic you want to talk about we can move on but i'm just intrigued to know uh from times past gone by do the medicines come up in demand or is it kind of the the food determines the medicine and they kind of go hand in hand i think it's uh, that the medicines are need driven so what mm. people are suffering from we try to find solutions mm. and that's always going to have uh, an effect yeah on on human evolution i mean the the biggest of all is the advent of vaccination right which goes back now about 200 50 years or something like that mm. that uh, a large scale vaccination has been going on for the things like um, smallpox polio like smallpox yeah polio yeah. yeah um and so vaccinations have had the the greatest effect in the in that countless millions of people who would have died live and have been doing so for 200 years that means that the genetic makeup of our species is different because mm-hmm. the proportion of susceptible people to those diseases now much higher because they would have died in childhood without passing on their genes so they've been passing them on for a very long time but in an environment with vaccination in it that doesn't matter but it is a change nevertheless so we're different now yeah because i think of my situation and sorry sorry to put myself in it but it's um i have this uh 
uh, eye condition called Stargardt's disease, which is a form of macular degeneration. And um, I got it diagnosed with it when I was eight. I lost my central vision overnight, and it was quite a drastic manifestation of macular degeneration, uh, which happens. Stargardt's disease happens because of gene mutations. And I was like, hmm, would I have even survived 200, 300 years back? Or um, how did that happen, right? Because no one in my family, my immediate family has it. Like my, um, the genetic counselor said, maybe your parents are carrying a copy of uh, one of the mutated gene each. So it's interesting to think about it because, um, and also to, like, because you are an expert about the works of Charles Darwin. You've written a book called Darwin, A Companion. And you um, clearly understand him better than, I would say most, if not everyone alive. Uh, so what would a Darwin approach this world we're living in right now with vaccines, with the pandemic, with people with disabilities or with gene mutations? Could could you comment from that point of view? Well, what do, what do you mean exactly? The, um, the, the These things will always naturally arise. I mean, that's one of the fundamental tenets of Darwin's theory of evolution is that variation or variety in offspring mm -hmm. of everything, plants, animals, fungi, spores, is constantly happening. So right. you will always have new things being born every generation, which vary in every possible direction. Right. And you have a variation, which is in one possible direction. Right. Such things constantly arise. Now, it, Darwin's uh, process is that anything that varies in a way that is so harmful that the organism doesn't survive long enough to reproduce means that that kind of variation won't spread, won't proliferate, won't become more common. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas if it's something that's not harmful, it might spread more. And if it's a variation that's beneficial, then it will spread more, become more common. So, for example, that's how you get a, an insect or a bird that's so perfectly camouflaged to its background. Yeah. If you go back far enough, they were not camouflaged, but just the tiniest bit better coloration that made them a little bit less conspicuous would spread. And over generations, any little ones that are born that vary a little more in the direction of the coloration that helps, they leave more offspring. Whereas all the others that are born whose coloration varies in some other direction, they would tend to be filtered out. So that's how the process generally works. Whereas if things that vary are not causing uh, us to die, then there's no mechanism for them to to um, to reduce or to become less. And I get uh, this uh, concept, right? I mean, I, I want to know, I mean, what it's going to do because it's almost like we are, we hear this, right? Human beings are meddling with science. We're meddling with the genome. And, you know, like, for instance, I'm, I don't know if you have it in Singapore, but you have these dogs in uh, the US now, which are like these hybrids, right? Because they're a mix of a poodle and a retriever or a poodle and a, a Labrador. So they get like the, the non-shedding traits of a poodle and the docile, human-friendly traits of a retriever. So if we get to that level of meddling with other creatures, making, say, for instance, a tiger, which is a big cat into a cuddly little kitten, which is um, you know, you can put in your Louis, Louis Vuitton handbag and who knows, right? Um, and to, to something like CRISPR, which is gene editing, uh, what what can that result in? And I'm not, I, I know you can't predict evolution, uh, but what, what kind of uh, scenario can that change bring about? Yeah, well, that can definitely bring about um, more pronounced variation. Mm right through gene editing. But the strange thing is that no matter what we can think of, uh, it's happened before in the natural world, even things like gene editing, because bacteria are able to take bits of DNA from one organism and move it into another already. Right. It's been happening for billions of years. So there's oh. some absolutely crazy cases where you've got, I don't know, 
I mean, just as an example, this isn't a real one, but you'll have something like the DNA of a tomato in a, in a salmon, things like that. I mean, absolutely crazy mixes, oh, which wow. is okay. just as radical as what we are uh, now able to do with gene mm. editing. Right. So that's not, I think, going to result, well, who knows, in anything radical, because here's something you can rely on. Nature is tough. Mm. And we can uh, fiddle and manipulate all we want to make all kinds of interesting new things. But yeah. it, it's, I think, uh, wishful thinking to imagine that those are going to be tougher than the real thing that's <laughs> already out. Right. So when people talk about this engineered virus out of a lab in Wuhan, it, again, it goes into those splinter cells, right? Of <laughs> oh, well, I mean, that is within the realm of uh, yeah. possibility that a virus uh, can be, you know, viruses can be changed by people. Yeah. But they already change uh, constantly in the natural world. That's, yeah. That is evolution. Yeah. yeah. That, that they change. Evolution and change are the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, they constantly change. And there's a lot more viruses in all the living things in the world than there are in labs, which is mm. a tiny, tiny amount. So, yeah, you know, we and tend you, we tend yeah. to give disproportionate attention and worry and stress to things that we've heard about, even though they may be completely unrepresentative and not worth worrying about. You know how people worry about flying. They might yeah. be afraid of it, and so on. Yeah. And yet, it's proven that it is safer way to travel than going by car. Yeah, and it yeah. doesn't feel right, but it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's the same way with worrying about the lab-based viruses versus the entire world filled with viruses. Yeah, yeah. And more as uh, the ice um, covers thawing, you have a lot of ancient viruses that were trapped, which are being released now, right? <laughs> which is uh, uh, more people at the party. Um, yes. <laughs> but what what can we hope for? I, I don't expect like a forecast or a prediction, but just with this, um, you know, I, I've been speaking to a few people who are studying oceans and studying plastic pollution. So with all these things and with the world melting, according to every conference that is being held, a global warming and rising sea levels, is the present edit of human uh, beings or the present stage of human evolution, uh, will we be able to cope with these uh, environmental changes that we've introduced? I I think the answer is absolutely yes. Okay. Uh, because when you look at how long we've been around, uh, yeah. so our bodies are basically the same for the last 200,000 years, 300 mm. maybe more. Right. And so that... Uh, body that evolved, and most importantly, the, the intelligent brain that evolved in Africa way back then, mm -hmm. and some of us left, and then spread all over the world into every environment on Earth, right. from the Arctic to the harshest, driest, hottest desert. So mm. we are adaptable enough to cover everything on this planet. So even if the planet does radically change its uh, its temperature and so on. Um, I've no doubt that uh, we are absolutely uh, adaptable enough to to keep up with that. Yeah, hmm. that's good to know. So maybe we'll have more hybrid, uh, like a human with a iPhone built in. Who knows, right? <laughs> Just to cope with. I but, wouldn't uh, be surprised. Right. Um, so, Doctor John, what got you so keen, uh, especially, of course, as a historian of science? But what made you? Uh, focus so much of your time and research in studying uh, these two people, these two significant um, scientists from history, uh, being Charles Darwin and Alfred uh, Wallace. So what was that um, drive towards this? Mm. Yes, I, I, I'm often asked that question. I don't really have a very good answer for it. <laughs> I have always studied history and I was uh, did my PhD Mm -hmm. uh, at Cambridge in Victorian science, right. um, actually on um, the history of the phrenology movement. And Darwin was a very peripheral figure to uh, my research there, but I wanted to look more at people's ideas of nature and, and how science worked. And 
being a bit of a amateur naturalist myself, very mm. interested in the natural world and living things, the overlap between a vic the Victorian period in science and Darwin, <clears throat> I think naturally led me in that direction because Darwin is, as a historical subject, I find one of the most interesting figures to study, particularly because he had a knack for noticing things that other people had never noticed before. Some mm -hmm. people are like that. They notice something mm -hmm. everyone else has had right in front of them, never really noticed or thought was important. And then if that person then does a lot of work on it and, and, and says to everyone, aha, look, this is actually important and not insignificant, then they can really change things. Mm. And so, yeah, that can be very interesting. So there was a time when I knew a bit about Darwin and I had learned that he had come up with this theory of evolution. But for 20 years, he kept it a secret. I found that uh, a very... Uh, sort of um, dramatic and interesting idea uh, story that he knew mm. where we come from. He knew how life on Earth works, mm. that it had changed continuously all, all, all through the history of the Earth. And others, nobody else did. I found that very dramatic. I wonder, yeah. what, what was that like? Uh, unfortunately, uh, once I um, really had become... Uh, more familiar with materials and so on. I, it, it was my lot to stumble on the fact that that famous part of Darwin's story is wrong, that he didn't keep his theory a secret for 20 years. Oh, he didn't? Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. this was an idea that arose only in the 1950s and 60s and then became hugely popular and influential until by the 1980s and 90s. Everyone believed it, experts and non-experts alike. And that is one of the ways that uh, science and every other kind of information works is that some stories are just, they sell better. They're yeah. preferable. Yeah. And that unfortunately counts for more than if they're true. Mm. I'm sure you know many examples. where, And it's a sort of reflection of the appearance matters, right? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. So the example of Darwin unable to talk about evolution because supposedly society was so conservative and science would have been so prejudiced against it, made it impossible for him to publish in that early time. It makes so much sense on the face. Yeah, this oppressed scientist trying to fight the shackles of society in that yeah, time. Yeah. It just sounds it's, like the... He, this, and yeah, that's... Uh, that's the story we want. We want the story of heroes and villains, right? We want the story of the saviors and the saved. Um, the dark yes. and the light, the good and the evil. Um, so in some sense, we want Darwin to be, uh, you know, Harry Potter. We want Darwin to be the, the person who is under the, 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 the realm of, of, of torture from the queen or the bad, whoever the bad person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Uh... A lot of my work then has been looking at how the stories have changed and mm -hmm. why. And why, why did they change? So, for example, uh, people have been telling the stories of Darwin and Wallace and others for, for over 150 years. Mm -hmm. But people you, tend to read things from only about the last 20 years or Yeah. Okay. And so it's like we were saying before about having a, an information group that's diversified in one way and you have your head full of one kind of ideas. Yeah. Then when you encounter something else, like say you read a book from 100 years before about Darwin, you see it in your way. Yeah, yeah, you see yeah. see it as confirming your view. Uh, and what I've been doing for quite a while is looking at what people used to say and when I noticed that it is very different from what people say now about the same thing, Mm. And they have the exact same evidence before them, like the same letters or whatever. Yeah. Then you have to wonder, well, hang on. How is this story completely different now? Nothing new has been found out since way back then. And so I trace back how the story is going back through uh, biographies and articles and books, going back 100 years or more. And then you can find where 
different elements of the story first arose, where people often just made a mistake. But if it's a mistake that makes the story more dramatic、mm. or more interesting, it will spread, and eventually some of those can come together, and you get a story that is fundamentally completely false <laughs> and bears、yeah. no relation to historical reality anymore. But it's preferred by everyone. And、so、it almost it's sounds like the origin right. of modern day religion as well, in some way, right? Because there are a lot of people who say that the the person they call the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was actually just a a, a man who was、um, protesting certain things that the Roman、um, what do they call him, the Roman prelate in that region was doing, and he was more of a Greta Thunberg than Son of God. And、uh, the story that was told then was much more glorified. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but I've heard one version of this. So it seems like it's much better to have him as the Son of God, who was resurrected in three days and walked on water, and you know those things, than just this annoying teenage, you know,、um, kind of prehist or medieval or <laughs> or ancient Greta Thunberg. I don't know why I'm mentioning her name twice, but it's just <laughs> yeah. No, that's I know、uh, uh, the the the. Uh, evolution of the stories in Christianity is exactly the same. They have、yeah. also changed dramatically over、yeah. time, and、uh, yet、yeah, the, the idea of and, and that biblical scholars have have written a huge amount about this. We know about this in great detail. This is another example of the distance between the experts、mm. and people in completely different areas. The experts know all of this. <laughs> They know <laughs> where the story came from. We want the People Magazine version. <laughs> yeah, but、uh, yeah. The, so the idea of Jesus being not a an itinerant preacher, but but being the Son of God, is a is a、uh, is a story whose origins we can trace. We can、mm. see how they changed. Now, as a historian, I would wish that my readers would find that argument to be of more weight than、mm. tends to happen. So, for example. If I can show my readers that you think that、uh, it's unquestionably true and obvious that Darwin was afraid and, and kept his theory a secret for twenty years, yeah.、Um, but I can show you that no one ever said that or thought so, yeah, for a hundred years until that began to be tentatively suggested, and I can show you the story emerging. Hundred years later, and gradually becoming stronger and stronger. That's where the belief comes from. Yeah. And yet, once、uh, you've shown its origin, then to continue to believe on it as, as a historical fact, I think is a, is a shame because it's yeah it's not true. I mean, just the idea that the the, the people who visited the, the the painting of the Last Supper or the the, the The, the cathedrals in in France,、uh, the the number of visitors went up after the Da Vinci Code or、uh, Dan Brown's other books.、It、clearly shows that you know historians、um, need to sort of I think collaborate with novelists, right? Because <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, well, it's it's difficult because、uh, historians I think are not very well consulted when it comes to historical films and historical dramas. Yeah,、uh, the The way that films and even even historical documentaries, the way that they are made, is more Hollywood and、yeah. more entertainment than anything close to historical fact,、uh, which makes it、um, for me very almost impossible to enjoy things like a historical drama. Yeah, yeah like I the, can't the, help seeing that everything is fake. Like a Downton I, Abbey for you must be a nightmare, right? Because yeah, 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 exactly. The way they—it's not just that the sets are wrong and the clothing and、uh, and so on, but also the way they speak and the things that are going on in the story、mm. are the kinds of things that can only happen to people that today that only people today would think of. So what you have are people from our time put back into the past and wearing.、Uh, Nice clothes, but what the story you're watching and the dialogue and the feelings that it are all completely fake and couldn't possibly have happened that way. So it's a projection of the truth as a modern. What's、well, a projection of the present? Of the present, yeah, right, right, yeah, right. into the past. And I, as a historian, I can't suspend disbelief enough usually to yeah to enjoy them.、Um, I and you know I I I kind of.、Um, 
I can't empathize with you because I'm not a fellow historian, but I kind of understand the the idea because I like reading historical fiction. Um, so I read people like Connie Gilden or uh, pe- people like that who write about, say, Caesar's Rome or about the War of the Roses. And what they do say um, is that we try to keep as much historical, stick to historical fact and take liberties with the character. But um, the reason I bring that up along with what you just said is how hard was it beginning out on this journey of studying these uh, two um, scientists' work? Was it, uh, well, not how hard was it, but how important was it to have a sense of perspective from that point and that time from them as individuals, as opposed to what you just said, trying to project the present back on their works. And and, and there is a sense of bias, there's a sense of context, there's a sense of living in the 21st century and viewing these textbooks or these letters that are 150 plus years old. So what was the process for you like? Well, that is the process of becoming a historian. It's gradually, very slowly and painfully starting to get it, Mm -hmm. starting to understand the differences between the time you're investigating and the present, starting Mm -hmm. to understand how uh, an untrained modern reader can can go to an old book like one of Darwin's or the Bible or anything. Yeah. And they can read it and they and, and the words might be in English and it seems to make sense, but there are ideas that they have from reading the text are completely uh, wrong in the sense that they bear no relation to the time when that was made. Mm. If you don't understand the context in which something is made, the writing is unintelligible. You can very plausibly think it means something to you, but since you don't know about the context, you can be, you will be completely wrong. And, that's something that takes a very long time, and it's not something that you either get it or you don't. It's a, it's a, it's a gradual spectrum. You gradually get better and better sense yeah. of the time and the context. And I can go back and read things that I've read before, and see things in them that I missed before, that I didn't appreciate before. That mm. this little turn of phrase was referring to something that had meaning back then, and if you didn't, if you didn't know that, you would miss it would understand what the writer was saying so when people read old things today uh that is what uh, that is the major problem is that Mm. we read them ignorantly as if they were speaking to us they weren't speaking to us they were speaking to people at the same time and all their ideas and their whole world is gone and so we don't know what they really meant that's true of every historical period so from such an important discovery about yourself as an individual, as an academic, as a scientist, when you have to put yourself uh, painstakingly at times in and remind yourself constantly that this was not spoken to or addressed to a person of my time, but you constantly have to keep that as your landscape when you're trying to paint or repaint this picture, or restore this picture. So all these processes are time time taking. Uh, they, they, they kind of are also a very sort of inward in some way um, to remind yourself to understand yourself and not project your um, dominating uh, trait onto that situation. So what what has that uh, left you with and maybe something that can help people make sense of this information overload era we're living in. So what are some of the things, if any, um, that helped you um, shape your perspective and also shape you into a person that can um, view things in context? I think the best analogy that occurs to me is that it's a bit like being a translator. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you speak more than one language, as you probably do and as I do, Mm -hmm. if you want to tell someone who speaks a different language uh, what something is about, what it means, and so on, uh, it can be very, very difficult. And when you're trying to explain what people thought or were saying in the past, it's similar. You have to translate it. So you may be able to understand what they were saying back then, fine. 
But in order to explain it to a modern audience who speaks a different language, it's very difficult. I have a lot of respect for people who do uh, high level translation work because it's, I now, I appreciate now that it involves as much intelligence and creativity as mm. the original creator or writer did. In order so it's to, not just like a Google remake. Translate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to remake it, rewrite it. So there's almost the physical that, words, and then there's hmm. the uh, non physical communication behind those words, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's difficult to to translate all the nuances, right? And, it, mm. it, and, and it's frustrating as well because you really can't do that. <laughs> when you're trying to share with people that this is what they were saying and this is what they were doing, and you know your, your readers or your listeners can only get so much of it despite your best efforts. Um, mm. But... Yeah, that's the that's the uh, circumstance that we're in. That you do your best with the translation, and you do your best with communicating, but it will always be a struggle. Which, well, maybe some other way of explaining might have been better. We always have to work at. And you know, we have compared to what uh, people at at that, that time were using to document, which was uh, written texts. But maybe if you go back 5,000 years back, it was just word of mouth. They told stories sitting around a fire when they were in the tribe. To now we have YouTube, we have podcasts, we have documentaries, docu-series, we have uh, Instagram stories, we have TikTok reels. We have so many different ways to capture the moment or that particular, uh, that particular experience. Uh, as a historian, what do you project in 150 years? How would people interpret you and I talking today? Uh, on this podcast? Well, I think that the, the, the same game rules will will still apply, mm. that they will live in a very different world in which they will speak differently, have different ideas and so on. And understanding people from the past will be exactly the same or very difficult. Um, I don't think things are really that fundamentally different today than they have been for the last uh, 100 years. For example, the other night, I watched on YouTube mm -hmm. a movie um, that was 100 years old. It was a, a silent movie with Buster Keaton. It was hilarious huh. uh, <laughs> from uh, 1922. Mm. Um, now, that's a completely vanished world. Right. All the people back then, they're dead. Their ideas and the way they spoke and the references and so on will be lost on those. So as a historian, I do get more of it, I suppose, than, than most people today would. But still, uh, it's exactly like you're, what you're asking. People in the future will have access to our to videos of us and our sounds and so on, but we already have access to people 100 years ago. We can mm. listen to them, we can see them, and we don't get it. We don't get it. <laughs> so, for example, when you, when you see a... Uh, I say a World War II movie. Yeah. Doctors uh, talking and so on. Um, but uh, they sound absolutely nothing yeah. like soldiers did in World War II. We have thousands of hours of recordings and films from that time period. The way they spoke, the, their humor, and, and the way they moved and everything, uh, you can see it exactly. Like our future descendants will be able to see us from YouTube or whatever. Uh, yeah. But when 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 filmmakers today want to make a film about that time period, they just throw in modern actors, modern accents with modern uh, words and language. For example, I saw a movie uh, a year or two ago. It was one of these new Sherlock Holmes movies with mm. um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah. And in the movie, he's um, he's painted himself to look like the side of the room so that his friend comes in and can't see him, and then he steps mm -hmm. forward, and he went from being invisible to, and he says, ah, oh, you know, I've, I've been working on my camouflage. And, well, as a historian, I know that the word camouflage didn't exist in the <laughs> 1880s. Of that course, word, that's the period you studied. That's the Victorian it, period. Yeah, it came yeah. about in the First World War. Whoopsie. Right? <laughs> military uh, military um, camouflage. So... Mm. That's an idea that could not have really been expressed that way in the time period they have put it. 
Uh, but there are more serious uh, cases. There's the one in, um, uh, to talk about the Bible again, there's a famous example where in the uh, Bible, Jesus is talking to uh, a man uh, called Nicodemus. And they have a conversation in which Jesus tries to tell him about how you need to uh, be born again. And the the story is originally written in Greek, about all of the New Testament is in Greek. And Nicodemus doesn't understand uh, the word and asks for clarification because he thinks Jesus is saying uh, that you have to be born again from your mother. And Nicodemus says, what? How am I supposed to crawl up in my mother's womb? And Jesus is saying, no, you need to be born from above. That's what he needs. But that misunderstanding only happens in Greek. Whereas Jesus and this man didn't speak Greek. They spoke Aramaic. Mm-hmm. But that word cannot do that in Aramaic. You can't have that misunderstanding about from above or again. Uh-huh. Which shows us that that conversation never took place as uh-huh. people believe. Because the writer who wrote that story uh, many, many years later spoke Greek and wrote it in Greek. But that discussion could not have happened in Aramaic because the words are wrong. That's such a powerfully strong and dangerous message at the same time, right? Um, Interpretation, translation, and sentiment. These are such uh, important things which are at at the, basically they're they're, they're, they're on, they're on the receiving end of an merciless onslaught. So which almost goes to say we are in such a powerful time with information reach and information access, but it's one of the most dangerous times as well. Yeah, I think, uh, but, and yet we have so many tools which we are not yet good at using them. So, for example, I often find my students uh, are unaware of some, some, some basic facts. I think, well, how could they not know that? They have the internet. They could, mm. <laughs> they could Google on, on their phone in an instant and find yeah. the answer to something. But yeah. they're not used to doing that. They're not very good at at getting that kind of factual information from the internet because they spend most of the time using it for entertainment and social media. Right. So it's out there, but we're not very good at using it yet. Right. No, I think this has been very enlightening, uh, Dr. John, because I, as I told you when we, before we started recording, it's, it's so important to get people like you to explain the process to explain the hard work, to explain the commitment behind a certain um, purpose in your career and to also show people that it's so important to understand context and to also not project your version of the truth or your present uh, onto certain situations. Um, And I really appreciate you taking the time to do that and sharing your um, insights and your expertise on Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace with me and my listeners today. Thank you. My pleasure. So if people want to know more about the project that you're, um, that, the, the resources that you have online, where can they find that? And how can they um, get more knowledge on this topic? <laughs> yes. Well, the easiest thing is simply type Darwin Online into Google. Uh, I'm the director of the Darwin Online Project, which is mm-hmm. the most comprehensive historical website on any single historical individual in the world. So we've gathered together a lot of different kinds of materials on this one uh, figure in the history of science all in one place. Brilliant. Darwin Online. And it's free. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. John Van Wy. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time, joining me and joining everyone listening on the Soapy Dow Show. Appreciate it.